Three weeks after the inauguration of President John Kennedy, a gentleman from Jackson, Mississippi, wrote a letter to President Kennedy, which set in motion one of the great civil rights battles during the civil rights movement. We're thrilled to have in our midst Mr. Meredith, Mr. J. H. Meredith, who was the pivotal part of an event which occurred a little, almost 45 years ago. Tonight, we're going to talk, have an opportunity to talk to Mr. Meredith about himself, life, times, and his vision. In addition, tomorrow at 10.30 here, Mr. Meredith is going to share a speech which is very provocative, and I encourage all of you to attend. This event would not happen without a variety of individuals and corporations, including the New York State Council on Humanities, the Jamestown Public Schools, Harris Beach, Attorneys of Law, Henry, thank you, Cummins, Inc., Jamestown Engine Plant, Carla Howie, and a variety of folks that are here, thank you very much. Lloyd & Company, to John and Jean, thank you. United Refining Company, Allegheny Asset Management, Tom Stafford, thank you. Carlson Jewelers, Classic Brass, Community Development, Community Eye Care Specialist, Digital, Evans Elfie Restaurant, Faulkner Electronics, Faulkner Printing, Jim, thank you. L.J. Stein and Company, Moore and Myatt, Bob, thank you. Robo Enterprises, Safety Compliance, and all the folks who are in the audience who in various forms or manners are part of the Robert H. Jackson Center. We thank you. The itinerary tonight is we're going to show a brief eight-minute video to help everybody get into a formal mindset of the individual who we're thrilled to have in our midst. After which, uh, Mr. Meredith and I, who've already been mic'd up, uh, will be sharing a conversation up here. And if time permits, uh, we'll be gathering some questions from the audience later on. This will be for the Jackson Center Archives, uh, where, and this is all part of a process which the Robert H. Jackson Center started a little more than six years ago, honoring the legacy of Justice Robert H. Jackson. And part of that legacy was his life as a Justice of the Supreme Court. He was a Justice from 1941 through 1954. I want to introduce somebody who was part of Justice Jackson's Supreme Court life, E. Barrett Prettyman, Jr. Barrett's here. He came in from Washington today specifically for tonight's event. He was the law clerk for Justice Jackson during the 1953 term and was also the law clerk for John Marshall, Har Marshall Harlan, uh, who succeeded Justice Jackson during the 1954 term. And for our purposes, he was there as the sole law clerk during Brown versus Board of Education. And as we know, that case ruled unconstitutional, the doctrine of separate but equal. We also know that the next year there was a case, Brown versus Board II, of which Mr. Prettyman was there at the Supreme Court, which during that term, Brown versus Board II enunciated the concept of integration with all deliberate speed. It's that with all deliberate speed which led to uh, circumstances which occurred in the University of Mississippi which Mr. Meredith was a part. So there's a complete and direct connection to those activities that occurred at the Supreme Court under Justice Jackson and what we are in the process of doing today. I'll be introducing more formally in just a second Mr. Meredith. However, let me just pause and show the 10 minute video.
federal courts were also unyielding, ruling again and again that this resistance was unconstitutional. But while the court cases were fought, the schools stayed closed, and the children, especially the black children, paid the price. So the crisis in school desegregation continued. In the fall of 1960 in New Orleans, four little black girls were sent to first grade in white schools. It caused a citywide riot. This was six years after the Supreme Court's ruling and segregation was still a fact of life across the South. But in those six years, desegregation had become a fact of political life. Schools were an issue that touched all Americans, black and white, and national leaders were beginning to recognize that. Can we honestly say that it doesn't affect our security and the fight for peace? when Negroes and others are denied their full constitutional rights, when we who, when we in this country... This kind of rhetoric raised black hopes that the new president would lead the nation in a new commitment to civil rights. In 1961, a black man named James Meredith would test that commitment when he filed suit for admission to the University of Mississippi. His lawyers were Jack Greenberg and Constance Baker Motley of the NAACP. When the Meredith case was filed, it coincided with the Freedom Riders' arrival in Mississippi, uh, which, uh, of course, was not a good context in which to bring that suit. But those were historical developments which we could not control because it was a genuine revolution on the part of black people. James Meredith called it a new spirit among blacks, as sit-ins and freedom rides spread from other southern states into Mississippi. That spirit was part of Meredith's own readiness to face the struggles he knew were ahead. What made you decide on Ole Miss? Well, I thought that I should get an education in my own state. And of course, uh, Ole Miss, to my knowledge, is the best university in the state. And also, it's the only school that offers the courses that I'm particularly interested in. Well, you say you were interested in going to the University of Mississippi even as a boy. Uh, were you aware at that time that Negroes did not go to the University of Mississippi? Well, I've been aware for a long time uh, of the so-called place for the Negro, yes, I've been aware. Therefore, you've wanted to overcome this barrier since you were a boy. Uh, that's right. I think that the facade that he would present to the public uh, was one that was somewhat cold, somewhat cocky, but it was necessary to do that in order to protect himself, because after all, he was a human being with feelings, with fear. Friends, I'm a Mississippi segregationist, and I am proud of it. Mississippi, from its governor on down, was the most militant of the segregationist states. It was the home of the Citizens Council, a group formed specifically to defeat integration. In 1955, the Citizens Council had helped crush the first attempts at desegregation in the state by using economic threats and violence. We must eliminate the cowards from our front lines. You did not elect me governor of Mississippi to bargain your heritage away in our smoke-filled hotel room. The governor took a very active role in um, uh, talking about the threats that the state would make uh, on its uh, blacks who would uh, try to uh, enter the school. It was um, an effort to instill fear uh, in the hearts of blacks, and it was also an effort, and a very successful one, to arouse fear.
fear and uh, a kind of frenzy uh, in the white community to fight back. Marley Evers' husband, Medgar Evers, was head of the state NAACP. Evers himself had once tried to integrate Ole Miss, and now he counseled James Meredith. It was a long, hard legal battle. Finally, after nine months, the district court ruled there was no policy of segregation at Ole Miss. It was so unreal for the Mississippi to argue and for the judge to hold that there was no policy of segregation at the University of Mississippi. Everyone in the state of Mississippi, and I am sure almost everyone in the entire country, knew that there was segregation at the, in the state of Mississippi. And for, and for the university to assert that there was no segregation, and for the court to find that there was no segregation, was just uh, like a, a, a land of fantasia. The Court of Appeals reversed the decision, ruling Ole Miss must accept James Meredith. The question then, as in Little Rock, was who would enforce the order? a question the court asked directly to the president's representative. It was always clear as crystal. And I personally made a commitment, knowing the president would back it up, to the Fifth Circuit sitting on bank, all, all nine of them, uh, that whatever force was necessary to, to uh, make their order effective would be applied. I have made my position in this matter crystal clear. I have said in every county in Mississippi that no school in our state will be integrated on our new government. I now call on every public official and every private citizen of our great state to join with me in refusing uh, in every legal and every constitutional way and every way, every manner available, my friends, to submit to illegal usurpation of power by the Kennedy administration. The conflict was crystal clear, but the politics were not. The president and his advisors were determined Meredith would go to Ole Miss. But Kennedy was also determined to avoid direct involvement, which could cost him key Southern Democratic support. The president wanted a political solution. Five days later, on September 25th, Armed with more court orders on his behalf, James Meredith tried again to register at the University of Mississippi, this time at its Jackson office, and this time accompanied by John Doerr of the Justice Department and U.S. Marshal James McShane. This is Hagen Thompson at the State Office building in Jackson. James Meredith has just arrived in the custody of federal officials and apparently making his way up to the 10th floor to register. And in they go, and we'll switch now in just a moment. The crowd is booing lustily inside the Wolfock building. They have a crowd of several thousand inside and out. Again, Governor Barnett was waiting. I took an oath when I was uh, inaugurated governor of this state to uphold and to try to maintain and perpetuate the laws of Mississippi. Gentlemen, my conscience is clear. I'm abiding by the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Mississippi and the laws of the state of Mississippi. Once again, a governor's action had created a constitutional test. Now the question was, would President Kennedy use the U.S. Army as President Eisenhower had. Kennedy was still reluctant. Instead, he tried secret telephone negotiations with Governor Barnett. Well, now, you talk... You just don't understand the situation down here. Well, the only thing is, I got my responsibility. Well, this is not my order. I just have to carry it out. So I want to get together and try to do it with you in a way which is the most satisfactory and causes the least chance of uh, damage to uh, people in uh, Mississippi. That's my interest. All right. Would you be willing to wait a while and let the people cool off? on the whole thing. Yeah, how long? But you make a statement to the fact, Mr. President, that under the circumstances existing in Mississippi, that uh, there will be bloodshed. You want to protect the life of, of, of James Meredith and all other people. And under the circumstances at this time, 
It just wouldn't. Kennedy used the U.S. Army, as President Eisenhower had. Kennedy was still reluctant. Instead, he tried secret telephone negotiations with Governor Barnett. Well, now, will you talk? You just don't understand the situation down here. Well, the only thing is, I got my responsibility. This is not my order. I just have to carry it out. So I want to get together and try to do it with you in a way which is the most satisfactory and causes the least chance of uh, damage to uh, people in uh, Mississippi. That's my interest. All right. Would you be willing to wait a while and let the people cool off on the whole thing? Until how long? Could you make a statement to the fact, Mr. President, that under the circumstances existing in Mississippi, that uh, there will be bloodshed, you want to protect the life of, of, of James Meredith and all other people. And under the circumstances at this time, it just wouldn't be fair to him or others uh, to try to register him. At well, then at what time would it be fair? Well, we, we could wait. A, I don't know. It might be in uh, two or three weeks. It might cool off. Well, would you undertake to register him in two weeks? Well, now, you know, I can't undertake to register myself, but uh, you all might make some progress that way. Yeah, well, we'd be faced with it. Unless we had your support, the insurance would be... I'm going, to, I'm going to cooperate. The situation in Oxford was becoming very tense as hundreds of people streamed into the area to defend Old Miss and the Southern way of life. Saturday, September 29th. The Ole Miss campus was deserted as the students flocked to Jackson for the football game against Kentucky. The halftime speaker was Governor Ross Barnett. After the marshals had secured their positions, James Meredith was flown into Oxford Airport and driven to a secret location at Ole Miss. The crowds didn't know where he was, but they knew he was on campus. And at 8 o'clock, just as the president went on the air, Ole Miss turned into a battlefield. Of course the president's going to win in the end. He's got the whole armed forces of the United States. He can call in the Air Force. He can bring Navy ships up the Mississippi River. He can call out the Army, as he did. He can drop parachuters in. I suppose he could shoot missiles at Oxford, Mississippi. So he's going to win at the end. I uh, reported to my office. As I recall it, uh, there weren't very many of the staff there. Uh, Many of them were too afraid to come to the campus uh, on Monday. And uh, later, uh, James Meredith and came to my private office, and I accommodated the registration there. It wasn't a, a cause for laughter and champagne, uh, but it was a cause for, for, for some relief, and, and it, it was the fact that that was over with. I mean, in a way, Oxford had become the symbol of massive resistance and the final gasp of the Civil War, if you want to look at it that way. And it was over. It had ended. turmoil and conflict. Two people have been killed. 
Do you have any uh, feelings of guilt? Have you given it any second thoughts? I'm very sorry that uh, anyone had to get hurt or killed. But of course, I think that's an unfair question to me. I don't believe any of you believe that I had anything to do with that. How are you getting along in school, sir? Just fine, just fine. How are the students uh, that have been talking to? Have there been any reactions? Uh, no, just acting like students, I suppose. Is this a kind of a lonely life for you, despite all these people around you? I've been living a lonely life a long time. It was a lonely victory for James Meredith, but it was a victory for him and the country. The Constitution had held and been reaffirmed in a major crisis. Thousands of black people felt the victory and saw James Meredith as an example to follow, a symbol like the Little Rock Nine of their own power to move the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Meredith. You talked earlier about you, one of the real prized possessions in your life is your grandchildren. And at some point, your grandchildren are going to snuggle up to you and say, Grandpa, uh, after they've watched something like this on the History Channel, and they say, Grandpa, explain a little bit about what it, what it drove you to do what Granddaddy. you did. Granddaddy. Granddaddy. Well, frankly, I've never talked to my grandchildren or any of my children about any of this. I felt that their life was their life and uh, <coughs> that uh, what I could do was the best I could to prepare them for life. Uh, so that's uh, um, the way I've dealt with it, rightly or wrongly. Born in 1933 in Mississippi, uh, obviously highly segregated uh, state. Did you find that growing up with your mother and your dad, uh, who you had, you know, both had great respect for, was the goal, was that implanted at that time that you really thought you'd try to make a difference? When did that seed arrive? Well, from birth, uh, <clears throat> it's too long a story to tell. Uh, my great great grandfather was the last selected leader of the Choctaw Nation. And all of my life from birth, basically all I heard was how humiliating and degrading it was for us to be ruling a nation for 2,000 years and then in many cases becoming slaves of that nation. And my uh, commission was to restore the power and the glory to my bloodline. And uh, so that really, uh, quite frankly, I was certain at the time in this picture, I was at least 50 years old before I realized that most people didn't have the same heritage as me and wasn't coming from the same place. Uh, so basically, uh, that is uh, uh, the, ba the real reality. Uh, you know, Mississippi, the historians have taught Mississippi history like Mississippi dropped out of the sky in 1798. Well, of course, the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, 
Spain was there for 200 years and France was there for 100 years before the uh, Americans got it and named it the Mississippi Territory. So I think probably the most less taught area in American history is the story of the Native Americans, particularly in the South. You find yourself enlisted in the Air Force. And at the time, was the Air Force an integrated Air Force? Well, uh, that probably was the most significant period of my life. Uh, in 1948, Harry Truman signed what they call a, a desegregation order. And what that order called for was for the branches of the military to submit plans for desegregating the, uh, their services. The Air Force was the first to submit the plan that was approved. And they started the program in uh, 1951. That was the same year I graduated from high school. And I uh, uh, knew about it and wanted to join because I, uh, you couldn't join the desegregated uh, Air Force from the South. So you had to go to a northern state to John, otherwise, if you joined from the South, they sent you to the old segregated airport. So I went to Detroit uh, and uh, signed up for the Air Force and then went to actually New York, uh, the Finger Lakes, uh, I think it was Geneva. Uh, uh, they had established a base. Uh, a training base, a boot camp, we used to call it in those days, for training recruits. And this was the first one that the Air Force had set up where blacks and whites uh, went to basic training together. And I was in that uh, the group uh, up uh, around the Finger Lakes. Uh, and my first assignment to technical school was New Mexico Western College, which the Air Force had opened up for training blacks and whites together. And I went to that. When I finished that, I was assigned to Topeka Air Force Base. It's named after one of the astronauts now. I don't remember which one. And <coughs> that there I was assigned to uh, B-29 bomber squadron, and the B-29 is, was the, that was like being a space a astronaut now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the top of the, of the line because, you know, that's the one that dropped the bomb that ended the war. And I was the first black ever assigned to a B-29 outfit. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, so that, and actually I was there nine years and throughout, uh, including even my last uh, assignment, uh, which was to Japan, uh, the United States had decided to let the Japanese provide administrative service. So they had set up this uh, Japanese uh, unit, and I was sent to Japan to supervise that unit. They knew more than me. So all I did was play God. But I mean, uh, but it was the, everything was like the first. So that really had a tremendous impact. And that's important. Because as hard as I was, and I have to admit, Merle Evers was right, boy, I, have, I, I was arrogant. Uh, I still wasn't absolutely sure that there wasn't something to this white supremacy and this black inferiority. It was only in Japan that I discovered that this thing man-made. I mean, and that was really significant. Uh, and of course, my thinking was, 
if it was man-made, it could be man-unmade. Mm -hmm. So that was the, uh, uh, so the Air Force was extremely significant in terms of, uh, now, you have to remember all nine, of, no, no, the first six years I was in the Air Force, when they were doing this uh, uh, desegregation thing, they had a 10% rule. In other words, no unit could, that was formerly white could ever have more than 10% black. I mean, they, uh, uh, they could have less than that, <laughs> you know, but they could never have more than 10%. So I was always that uh, one, uh, a small group mm -hmm. of blacks my whole nine years in the military. And, and the last, I was the only one. I mean, you see, because all the rest of them were Japanese. And that had a tremendous impact on my uh, thinking. During that time, you're in the Air Force, you read the newspaper one day, and it talks about the Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education. What was your reaction when you read that? Well, it's more important than that. You understand, I said my first assignment was Topeka Air Force Base. You understand, the Brown case was in Topeka. And I went there in January 1962, and of course that decision, I believe, was May of 1954. So I was there. I not only was there, I knew the, uh, uh, the Browns and the whole thing, but more important, my last promotion was there. And the commander of the base was a Colonel Busby from the Mississippi Delta. So uh, my promotion, I believe, came in July, and that was two months after the Brown decision. Now, normally when they promote, have promotion, they have a board of, uh, of sergeants and every now and then a lieutenant. But this base commander had all of the full colonels on the base to consist of this board. So, uh, uh, and they had me last. Well, they knew me because, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I was always making them do something on the base. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that they wasn't doing, that they're supposed to be doing. So... Uh, Colonel Busby had this special board of colonel, and after they finished everybody else, they got to me, and they said they'd already decided who was going to promote. Of course, that was me. And, uh, but they wanted to know if it was all right for them to question me about the Brown decision and the race thing. Really? And they did that for an hour, hour and a half. The big thing came out of that was two things. Number one, uh, <clears throat> Colonel Busby, after he, he had the others leave, he told me, uh, number one, uh, no, this was before the other colonels left, we are for you, but it's going to depend on you. But Colonel Busby dismissed them and told me he was from the Mississippi Delta. And he said it just like this, I'm not, I'm just repeating, I'm in quote. He said he was Mississippi Delta and that the whites in Mississippi would kill all of the niggas and half of the white folks before they would uh, uh, gi give up this white supremacy, their way of life or however they call it. But you understand what most affected me, and this was in 1954, was that Colonel Busby, I knew, was a special selected person to do this integration thing on this space. So here's a man telling me something ain't never going to happen, but he working to make it right, make it happen. So that, uh, that was very significant in terms of, uh, you know, uh, because uh, it was a conflict. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose to take the side that they 
would go, you know, that he was saying that as sort of a warning to me. But I did not believe he really believed it. <laughs> so, uh, so that was very significant. Was that sort of the same kind of mindset when you were looking at what Governor Ross Barnett was doing? <laughs> that it, it went, you had to say certain things publicly, but... Well, you see, uh, now you all cut that part out. But it wasn't the in there. I know what you're talking about. The first thing that Governor Boris Barnett said, which one of you is James Meredith? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you understand. I was looking for that it. That was the second time he'd done that joke. And he uh, later told my wife that he did it that time, which you didn't show, because it came over so big the first time when there wasn't no TV camera. He had to do it before the camera. But you understand, America is a strange place. And I, I, I'm certainly sure, although he never told me this, but I'm almost positive that most of the shenanigans that Governor Barnett pulled off was designed to protect the black people in Mississippi. I mean, because, uh, like when he called them, all of the law officers, officials, all of them to the Jackson to protect him from the feds. He knew the feds wasn't coming to arrest him. What he really wanted all those sheriffs and other people to do was to come where he could watch over them so they wouldn't take things in their own hand and mistreat blacks all over the state. Now, so, I mean, I have long believed that most whites were as dissatisfied with the status quo as any black. As a matter of fact, I knew as a matter of fact that whites were more restricted by the rules of white supremacy than blacks. And their violation of white supremacy was less tolerated. You understand that? You see, I mean, uh, and most people don't understand that. I mean, so uh, uh, it is uh, uh, a lot of, well, you know what happened to George Wallace. He was the biggest hater and in the last two terms of his election, he was the greatest pacifier and, and, and uh, black lover, that's not what he would say, it, in the state. Going back chronologically, you uh, leave the Air Force, you enroll at Jackson State, um, you're there for two semesters, and during that time in 1961, uh, there's the election of President Kennedy, uh, his inauguration, and what prompted you to write a letter directly to him? Well, uh, well, you got to remember now, uh, I came back to Mississippi with the explicit purpose of breaking the system of white supremacy. Now, the Kennedy election was very crucial because, as you remember, that was the first televised debate of a presidential election. And after that first Nixon-Kennedy debate, every college in America wanted to do uh, a, a mock debate. Jackson State wanted to do it. But strange as it may seem, there were all blacks in Mississippi that were involved in any way in politics were Republican. And they could not find one person on Jackson State campus to take the Democratic position. We're talking about a mock debate. So, of course, the strangest one on campus was old Meredith. So they approached me and asked me to be Kennedy. And in order to do that, I had to learn 
uh, all about Kennedy, particularly his uh, campaign rhetoric and the other thing. And as you know, Eisenhower is the one that sent the troops into Little Rock. And uh, uh, Nixon went further uh, uh, in his uh, appeal. So Kennedy, as a ploy, which really got him nom elect nominated as the, as the candidate, uh, injected a stronger civil rights plank, than what they used to call them, uh, than the Republicans had. And it went through. So nobody ever intended to enforce it. But, the, uh, but it was there. So because of that debate, I learned all of that. Mm -hmm. And the day that he was inaugurated, I sent my letter to the uh, university because the intent was to put uh, uh, public relations pressure on the Kennedy administration to either do what they promised or uh, have to pay the price. Did they get back to you? Uh, <laughs> very indirectly. And for the first two years, there was no acknowledgment of it until a few, uh, few days before the last court action. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, actually, there was a Harvard lawyer, uh, William Higgs, that had just graduated from Harvard. And uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he, he had his causes, and he wanted to do his thing. So uh, somehow he contacted me and told me he'd been in touch with the Justice Department, and they wanted me to write them a letter and deliver it to him, which I did. And apparently he delivered it to them. And then, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Ross Barnett was not only the governor, he had the biggest office building in downtown Jackson, Mississippi. And Bill Higgs had got his office in the Barnett building. <laughs> and <laughs> so the uh, day that Burke Marshall was supposed to call me, uh, <clears throat> Bill had hired him a black secretary. So <laughs> they uh, uh, evicted him, I mean, uh, and the secretary that same day, but he slipped back in with me and talked to Burke Marshall on the telephone. Uh, Burke Marshall, just for the audience, who was he? He was the civil rights uh, uh, head. He was the third man with Katz Kennedy, Katzenbach, and Burke Marshall in the Justice Department. Now you also sought out the NAACP and wrote a letter to th then Thurgood Marshall. Uh, why did you, did you seek their involvement? Was this just legal protection at this point? Well basically that was uh, Mega Evers. Uh, uh, you see Mega Evers office was directly across the street from Jackson State. So, uh, uh, you know, so he uh, uh, find out, found out about my letter to uh, 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 the Kennedys, and he uh, uh, wanted to uh, uh, get the NAACP involved. And he got almost got in real big trouble because, you know, the NAACP is one thing. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund is another. And uh, he didn't contact the NAACP lawyer. He contacted uh, Thurgood Marshall, which was a different group. And uh, so that's how that came about. This is from uh, uh, a book on the, the, the civil rights movement. It reads, when Meredith inquired about applying to Ole Miss, he concealed his race. The unaware registrar sent Meredith a letter that said, we are very pleased to know of your interest in becoming a member of our student body. 
Meredith then revealed that he was an African Mississippi Negro citizen. This bombshell stunned university and state officials who schemed for 20 months to keep Meredith out of Ole Miss. Hotly denying that race was a factor, school officials refused Meredith's application because it was late. Because Jackson State and Ole Miss operated on different academic calendars, because Jackson State was not accredited by the major accrediting association, and because Meredith did not present letters of recommendation from five Ole Miss alumni. As the duplicitous delays became transparent, Meredith asked the NAACP for help. Although Thurgood Marshall remarked that this man has got to be crazy to challenge Mississippi officials, he assigned the case to Constance Baker Motley, who we saw in the film. What was she like? Well, she was, if I had to credit one single person for making things happen, it was her. Uh, because Well, she not only was a woman, she was a brilliant woman. I mean, they, uh, and uh, <laughs> she knew how to get what she wanted out of me. I don't think nobody else could have done that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Whoa, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> well, first of all, there was only one person I knew of in America that had a Castro-style beard. And that was me. So uh, <laughs> the night before we were supposed to go to court to file a suit, she uh, asked me to, to cut it off. I didn't tell her I was. But the next morning, it was gone. That's impressive. <laughs> Throughout the process, as you were attempting to provide federal intervention with regards to your admission into Mississippi, clearly it was the legal system through which you, you, you found yourself involved in, whether it was the district court, which initially found that there was no uh, segregation policy in Mississippi. You, that must, you must have been... Now, all of that didn't mean nothing. You understand. <clears throat> the court was primarily brought in as a delaying, as a appeasing factor. You understand? <clears throat> However they say crazy Jane Meredith might have been, he wasn't no dummy. You understand? My sole objective was, you see, I spent nine years in the United States military. And in those days, the slogan was to defend the rights and privileges of democracy, freedom and democracy, not like be all you can be now, join the army, you understand? I spent nine years in the military protecting the freedom. When I went back to Mississippi to visit my mother, I had not only to get on the back of the bus, I had to get behind a black curtain on the back of the bus. And it didn't take a genius to figure out. I wasn't enjoying all the rights and privileges that I was fighting for. I never considered getting out of the Air Force, going to fight in Mississippi, anything other than the same fight that I conducted for nine years, protecting the rights and freedoms of democracy. And all of those things that you see in the movie were nothing but games. And I knew they were games. You understand that? I mean, that was to get control of the population. I mean, I never would have gone to Ole Miss if I hadn't known that the Kennedys was going to send the 101st and the 82nd and all them other crack troops, you understand? Without that commitment, which they didn't want to make because they didn't want to upset, you know, Kennedy was then hoping to be a second term president. So, I mean, but, you understand? I mean, uh, uh, without my personal knowledge, 
that the military was not only on alert but was coming, I would have never went. You see, my belief always is a good soldier ain't never a dead soldier. A good soldier is one that's always around the fight. Did they let you know that they were ready to use the troops? You better believe it or I wouldn't have went. Yeah. Who told you? Who let you know that? Was that through the Justice Department or? Uh, how, well, how? actually, the Justice Department. Uh, but you got to understand now the uh, 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 the president is commander in chief, but the Attorney General is uh, <laughs> was the law man. I mean, uh, so. Uh, it was, I'm not really sure, uh, probably John Doerr probably is the man that communicated with me. Now, uh, 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 but it was the, uh, yeah, but it wasn't, it was more than that. You got to understand, those troops <laughs> were parading out there where I'm looking at them. You understand? I mean, they, I mean, they, uh, it wasn't no mystery. I mean, they, as to what was going on, and of course, all the other troops had been called up and and, and were in motion. I mean, they were in movement. I mean, so the uh, it was uh, it was for real, and and you know, I still think, and most of the authorities believe. Without that force, Mississippi would have never backed down. Barnett was gaming, but the people who really were the power in Mississippi were dead serious. I mean, they, uh, they were not, they did not intend to give up their way of life. As this was, you made four attempts to register, er, and finally got through on the fourth time, I believe. And, and clearly the, the tension was, you could cut it with a knife. Did, did you fear for yourself? Well, you know, I don't know really how to answer that. I mean, because uh, fear got to, you, you see, Philosophy is really important. Now, I had fear, but my only fear was not being successful in accomplishing my mission. And my mission was to live. As far as I was concerned, I'd been dead all my life. If I hadn't been dead, I wouldn't have got behind the black curtain on the Greyhound bus. You understand? I was a dead man. I was fighting to live. So most people talk about fear. They're talking about dying living. That uh, didn't mean much to me. I mean that because, uh, you know, I have believed, you see, before I went into the Air Force, as a senior in high school, the American Legion had a contest why I'm proud to be an American. And I entered that contest and won. Now, because I really believe that America, and my theory was, I'm not proud of being American for what it is, but for what it can become. And I really believe that. And I still believe that, and it ain't there yet. <laughs> Don't want nobody to get that idea. Uh, but I genuinely believe that. At the same time, you were back and forth to uh, the campuses. President Kennedy and Ross Barnett were engaged in quite a telephone conversation, uh, which seemed, in retrospect, one where each was trying to save face with the other. Uh, were you aware that that was going on? Oh, yes, and I was. Ten times more afraid of Kennedy than I was of Barnett, <laughs> because see, in Mississippi, Barnett couldn't succeed himself, and 
<laughs> and Kennedy desperately wanted to be elected twice. I mean, so uh, my great fear was to <laughs> get the thing done and then evaporate, you understand? <laughs> I mean, uh, and that was my greatest concern. I mean, was uh, uh, an agreement. Uh, thank God they never really reached one. Though I understand what, again, in, in hindsight, that Bobby Kennedy also had lots of conversations with Governor Barnett and, in fact, at right. one point threatened to expose the conversations between right. his brother and he to the Mississippi public, which, do you get a sense that that kind of moved? Well, not process? only that. I, I won't try to speculate as to why. But there's no question in my mind and from the readings that I've done lately of the people who have written about it. Uh, the Attorney General was actually the man who caused whatever happened in the area of citizenship rights during the Kennedy administration. Uh, uh, the President never really was interested in that issue. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure at all that uh, Bobby Kennedy being the MacArthur's main man didn't really turn him in the wrong, in the other direction in a very significant way for America. I, I, uh, but I, I uh, 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 you know, uh, Robert Kennedy was a man I trusted, and, uh, and very few men have I ever really trusted. The day comes, October 1st, 1962, and you actually go and meet Registrar Ellis. What were you thinking? The follow of a sudden handed you a pen and said, you, you've done it. I was thinking that the Registrar Ellis was the only man on the campus with spirit. <laughs> I mean, in spite of him saying register, <laughs> he was delivering another message. And what he was calling me, I won't repeat it. Is it in your book? Well, no, but I saw him about 25 years later, and he acknowledged it. We, were, we both went to Mississippi, Ole Miss football game, and, uh, and we was walking across the area, you know, where they have the, uh, what they call it with these people, park and picnic. Uh, tailgate. Right, tailgate. <laughs> and we walked right into each other. Uh, and his attitude hadn't changed in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> did, did your paths cross with Ross Barnett's afterwards? Oh, many, many times. I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, we used to eat at the same restaurant. I, I like to think about the best restaurant in Mississippi, the Lafleur's restaurant. And uh, I never seen him when he didn't shake my hand. Mm -hmm. Not once. When you left that day from the registrar's office, you mentioned the book that the, about the first person you met as you were leaving, you met a, a black janitor. And what did they say? What did he say? Well, the most interesting thing, when I went up there for this, uh, I don't know, uh, the 44, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what? 40th or 40, 44th anniversary, I don't know what they was having. But the university had something, and he was there, and I met him. Okay. He's still living. I mean, they, uh, and he, you know, that was a most significant thing. When I walked out of the registrar's office, he was standing there, and he had a broom on his arm. And when I walked past, he touched me with his broom. And 
his, I interpreted the message to be, you don't have to worry. We all looking after you. Mm. And basically, when I met him a year before last, he said essentially the same thing. That that's what he intended the message to be. And he's, he's very old now. He uh, can't hardly move or walk, but he's still alive. During that year that you were at Mississippi, you struggled as to whether you getting admitted was really your goal or whether you were going to stay around for graduation. Well, <laughs> you got to remember, I'm a politician. I mean, they, uh, uh, so one of the things that I consider most significant, and I really think the results are still there, The media and the state wanted to paint me as a super extra. In other words, to make the standard so high that all the other blacks, particularly male, would be afraid to attempt it. My goal was to make every black boy feel like that he was superior to me and if O. Jane Meredith can make it, I can make it. And it literally turned out that way. Everybody felt sorry and pity for James Meredith. For one time they was talking about how I was going to fail. And I encouraged it to the hilt. <laughs> you understand? Because, first of all, I think I made one B. Uh, and uh, so, but it was very important for the mass of the people to think that there's this struggling, scuffling James Meredith. And then when I make it, oh boy. And uh, it has... Uh, I'm pretty sure it turned out that way. I don't want to take credit, but I know that was my goal. When you graduated uh, in 1963, you were quoted as, in response to a question, was it worth the cost? And you said, I believe that I echo the feelings of most Americans when I say that no price is too high to pay for the freedom of person, equality of opportunity, and human dignity. And that it was your sense as you were departing and that was you close that chapter of old miss all right and it uh, you know was only a chapter I mean uh, as an old man I'm starting to not be uh, as embarrassed but Most people want to make that look like the end, the accomplishment. I know that that is not the case, and I feel very certain that America, now more than ever before in our history, need to make the ideals of the founding fathers of equality for all people and all people being treated equal a reality. I think that America needs that in order to uh, succeed at the challenges that they face now, both internally and particularly externally. I think that uh, uh, that, uh, I mean, ain't no question in my mind that the founding fathers with the Constitution, they knew all of the imperfections. But 
I think they wrote it in such a way that the perfection could come over time. And I believe that the time has come now for even greater changes than, uh, you see, everybody has almost forgotten what happened immediately after the Civil War when slavery was not only declared uh, uh, gone, but the former slaves were declared full first-class citizens and for 10 years almost lived that way. But now, for the last uh, 150 years, almost all of America been acting like uh, that uh, America has always been what the billboards, the uh, uh, vitamins, the uh, 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 Tillmans, all of the other white supremacists created after the Reconstruction era as that's what America has been. That is not what America has been. And so it is uh, not so much of a uh, move forward to have what we have today. I didn't intend to try to make no speech. I was just going to answer your question. 1966, well, let's back up. 1965, President Johnson signs the, uh, uh, the Voting Act. 1966, you experience what's going on in Mississippi, and note that really just 8,000 or 400,000 uh, blacks have registered. And so you commence something called the Walk Against Fear, which was pretty much a solo walk running from Tennessee to, to, to Mississippi. Why'd you do that? If there was a whole lot of young people in here, I probably wouldn't really give you the answer to that. But since almost everybody in here is older than me, Welcome. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm getting old and forgetful. Repeat that question. Yeah, the march against fear. What's, what caused you to take that walk? All right. There were two primary reasons. One was to take the center stage and bring a serious challenge to the whole concept of nonviolence because I consider that to be the single most devastating thing to the ultimate full citizenship of the black race. Also, the fear factor I understood fear, but more particularly violence and the result in fear. And I knew that the primary tool used to establish white supremacy in America and I'm tired of y'all blaming it on the South. All America was essentially the same. But the, it was the use of violence creating a fear. See, the Klan has been blamed for many things. I ain't never had and I never knew a black man that had any fear of the Klan. The fear was what the authorities would do to the black and what the authorities would not do except encourage the white. I mean, that was the only uh, uh, fear. So, 
uh, it probably was naive, but I had a real belief. You know, you got to remember now, this is four years after Ole Miss. Uh, I knew the fear was still just as strong, but I didn't think it was justified. And it really proved out to be that way because the man that shot me was not from Mississippi, which enabled Mississippi to send him to Parchman Prison, making him the first white man ever go to Parchman Prison, everybody had heard of, for shooting a black. Now, uh, so, um, by inference, suggesting that no Mississippi white would have shot me, you understand? that I was right on that count. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> it might not be, but I mean, I, uh, but I, that was the, uh, so in effect, because very shortly, within two years after that, at least 300,000 of those 400,000 were registered. And to my knowledge, there wasn't any you know, uh, the killings and, uh, which had taken place up to that point. I mean, they, uh, it, it, to my knowledge, there wasn't any. You know, they're still dealing with these uh, clan things, but that all happened before that. I mean, that, uh, it, it was not after that. And I'm not saying for sure that there haven't been some after that, but I can't think of any of them. After you were shot, it, it caused quite a, we got a lot of interest, a lot of press. All of a sudden, Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, Floyd McKissick, all join in this, what started off as a one-man march. Let me explain that. You see, <clears throat> no, a one-man walk. Excuse me. Now, you understand, a walk is the exercise of a citizen's right to use the highways and byways. Mm -hmm. A march is a protest. You understand? And that is the difference that most people never get. You understand? A group cannot exercise the rights of citizenship. Only an individual can exercise the right of citizenship. So as you got this convergence because of, of your walk, of the nonviolent Martin Luther King and the Stokely Carmichael black power. Was, was that an unintended consequence of this? No, not by any means. And, and I can tell you, uh, you know, they, uh, after I got shot, they came to the hospital, and they met, and uh, a couple of nights, and they resolved most of the issues. But there was two issues. The number one question was, and they came to me for an answer, who was going to be the big man? My answer was, Whatever position is considered the best position, that's Dr. King's position. If that means speaking last, that's Dr. King. If that means speaking first, that's Dr. King. The only other question that the other, other issue discussed was this manifesto. But they didn't want me, they had already decided they didn't want me to sign it anyhow. But it came up. The only other issue was whether or not Stokely Carmichael could use the word black power. And my answer was that Stokely Carmichael was a citizen. He could say anything he wants to say. And that, uh, but I guarantee you it wasn't an accident because not only did I fear then, I still fear this nonviolence thing. It is un-American and it uh, uh, was a good tactic. Uh, but not the right thing to sell to a population. 
Did that sort of come to a head visually? I know that in, in August of that year, you had a chance to be on Meet the Press. <laughs> With, with uh, you, had, you had Whitney Young, Stokely Carmichael, Martin Luther King, Floyd McKissick, uh, Roy Wilkins, sort of the who's who of the, of the movement. How did that play out? That played out after the second question, they cut my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because I don't remember which reporter, but he asked me, if I had to do it over again, what would I do different? I told him I'd be carrying a gun. And they cut my mic off. And <laughs> it, was a, it was a special meet the press. Mm -hmm. It was one of the few hour meet the press in history. Mm -hmm. And they had Jane Meredith's mic cut off for 50 minutes of that hour. <laughs> How about when you got done and you broke uh, broke uh, at the end? Did, did anybody else talk to you about that? Did Floyd, did Whitney Young, or uh, you remember any of that? No, it was one thing for Stoker Carmichael to be talking about it. It was something else altogether for Jane Merritt to be talking about it. So, no, nobody ever asked me a question again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After that, you get into politics and you run against Senator Eastland. Um, now, Senator Eastland, who really becomes an interesting person behind the scenes in the whole civil rights movement because he was in charge of the, I think, the House or the Appropriations Committee, Senate Appropriations no, Committee. No, 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 Judiciary. Judiciary? So he really had control of the budget for J. Edgar Hoover. Well, he might have had that too. Yeah. But his power position in the um, rights thing was he was head of the Judiciary Committee com uh, and, and, he, and everything had to go through him. So you decided to really go after him. I mean, you... Well, yeah, uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you see, Senator Eastman, rightfully so, was the most hated white man in Mississippi since Bill Bull. But in 1965, he and LBJ made a deal. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in, in 1964, they passed the Civil Rights Bill. The Civil Rights Bill had also a voting section, but still uh, nobody, no blacks were registered to vote. So LBJ decided he was going to give the voting rights to the blacks in America. And he called Jim Eastland to his office. And he set Jim Eastland down. He said, now, Jim, so you're the only man that can give me trouble with this bill. He said, but I'm going to pass this bill.